It is the 21st October 2018 and we're very pleased to have here at 4711 Cashel Court up in Marlborough, good friend and brother Iwatli Blada, first son, first child rather, is it first child or first son? First child. First child of, of uh, our dear, dearly beloved leader, Edward Oliver Libla. Iwat, welcome. Welcome. Uh, welcome, uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, Iwat, uh, you were born in Dominique in the 1950s to Edward Oliver Libla. How many of you, what was your father's, well, we know your father was Edward Oliver Libla, and your mother's name? Uh, Ethel. And your brothers and sisters? Erin, uh, my only sister, uh, Einster, Ellsworth, and Eustace. Yes. And where and, and, and um, where did you attend school before you came to Roseau? Uh, Vickers uh, Elementary School. And um, um, when we moved to Roseau after, in 61, when my father won the election, I went to grammar school. Yes, indeed. I, I started in second form. Yes. Uh, but uh, Why didn't you go to first form? Well, because I, I actually took a test when I got there. Mm. They made accommodations, I guess. I did a test and they felt that. But I had to repeat second form because it was sort of half the year had, had passed. I, I, I see, I see. Do you remember your father's early days in politics? Oh, yeah. We used to go campaigning with him. He had a Willis Jeep. It was a reconditioned uh, U.S. Army Jeep uh, that he had bought. And uh, he would use that to, that thing could go through rivers and, you know, roads. Just from the war. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I, it, it actually had, it didn't have a key. Yeah, I remember it had a, you know, push start or pull start, but you also could use a crank. And every now and then when the battery was dead, we would have to go crank the thing. Mm -hmm. But he, and he had a microphone that used the battery of the Jeep, you know, yes. the big horn, and we used to set it up for him. Yes, yes. And we would go through the Cairo Reserve, through rivers, do whatever. And, uh, would your mother go along or should she stay home? Uh, she'd go along sometimes, but most of the time she'd be home. She was sort of the anchor in the yes, house, yes. You know, in many ways. Yes. What was life like in those days in Vikas? Uh, well, it was, it was very communal. I mean, I, um, my mother's... My grandmother lived at a place called Kota. It's, it's in a hamlet, you know, on a hill opposite Vekas. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I remember very vividly, you know, we because we lived closer to the the sea, when I would be asked to go get flying fish or fish, and when the boats came in, you know, then I would have uh, um, uh, mahi mahi or doad, as we call it, a dolphin. Mm -hmm. I would then have to carry a sizable piece, you know, from what we bought up to Cotown, which was a very steep hill. But when I got there, my grandmother would now cut it into pieces, and I would have to go share it with the, with the, with the neighbors. Some of them were relatives, but other people. And, uh, and then my way back, I'd be given provisions to take back to the house. So people were very communal. I remember having to help her sweep the yard, and we not only swept the yard in front of her house, I'd have to sweep two or three houses up and down, you know? Yes, yes. Uh, so, you know, we, we got, uh, uh, and, my, and my father obviously being in agriculture, we had land and there were provisions that we had. Very, it, sometimes it was humbling, but it, it, was, it was good because we made friends and at that age that are still, yeah. you know, we still, let me let me ask you this question. Uh, when were you born and where were you born? I was born in 1950 at the actually at the agricultural center in Portsmouth. Mm -hmm. So I was the only one of my siblings who was born there because my father was the agricultural instructor at, at Portsmouth, so at one mile up on the hill. So your father's roots were in agriculture. Where was he educated? He was educated, uh, well, after in the elementary school in uh, Vieques. He... Then went to, he got a job at the Botanical Gardens, and later on he went to Trinidad, the Imperial College of Tropical Agriculture, and he 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 studied agriculture generally. But if I recall, he his focus was apiary. Apiary. So he, as a matter of fact, even in his later years when he retired, he had some bees, mm -hmm. and he actually crossed. Uh, some African bees with some local bees because they were more hardy. Amazing. And um, yeah. so, so did you have a hive when you grew up? Or no. 
Yeah, yeah, we had hives, and uh, he had the smokers, and and but he knew, in every day he talked about the queen and the mating dance of the drones, yeah. to meet the queen, and and he'd give us these lectures, and I'd never forget he had a big picture of a beehive, yes. in color, and it was very uh, impressive. So your father was a scientist of a kind, then really, when you look at it. Yeah, well, not only that, uh, he has a diary, and I think it still exists, maybe at home, uh, at my mother's house where he would record the phases of the moon and he would associate it with plants and when it was the best time to plant, almost like a, an almanac. Yeah, yeah. And so he kept uh, copious records. Uh, one of his favorite things, because he liked fishing, he, he liked uh, the uh, jellyfish or squid as the bait. Mm -hmm. But he knew that when they came um, ashore, it was time with the tides and also the uh, phases of the moon, the full moon and whatever. So he would actually predict exactly when they were coming in and they had about an hour or two and he would actually hear them squawking or barking like dogs. I mean, this is, I, I mean, I, it was fascinating. And he would just get a basket and pick these things off the shore. Amazing. Yeah. So, so he used his knowledge of science and the moon yeah. and the cycles to favor his fishing and all of that. Yeah. And to first, favor his farming as well. Absolutely. And, and also he, he, he studied the stars. He studied the stars uh, and astronomy. And uh, the first thing I got him when I graduated from college was a telescope that I sent him. And he would actually know, he would look at the planets and he would actually know, and he, he, he taught me to distinguish between a star and a planet. And I think some of that too was he would, I'd go fishing with him as a young boy and I'd cut bait for him while he's sitting on the rock, you know, so it would be very treacherous to get to that rock out there, jutting it a little bit in the water. And he would be sitting there for hours. And I think his thought process, you know, you, you, you could sense you could sense that he was thinking yeah he was thinking about uh, you, you know government I mean all the things in politics I, I think he was that's where he really got it and he'd be out there and I'd be you know I'd want I'd be sometimes a little cold I want to go home I'd be sitting in the backyard sometimes I'd fish but he'd prefer if I just sit and cut bait and um and he'd be looking at his stars, and he'd go back home, and, he, and he'd talk to me a lot about that. So, you know, you, you, this is fascinating, because, you know, yeah. the average Dominican who knows of your father, at least those of my generation in particular, consider your father the father of the nation, yeah. the uh, leader who was uh, honest, hardworking, favored education, and opened opportunity for the average Dominican. So what were those, what was he like in the house? What kind of father was he? I mean, we already know that he was a good agriculturist. We know he's yeah, a fisherman. Yeah. We know that he was into science and astronomy and those things. But tell us about what, you know, what were his qualities in the house? I mean, uh, Well, he was the, the um, uh, what would I say, very strict. Uh, my mom was the one who was, we, we saw most of the time, because he was always either campaigning, playing dominoes with his friends and, um, he used to, he had a ritual, he would go down to the police station and play dominoes with the policemen. Uh, this guy, um, um, Joseph, who was an inspector, was his, his very good, good friend. And uh, his wife is also, Elaine Joseph, is a cousin of ours. Uh, she was a Maury Long, uh, so that would be his first cousin. And... Um, when he was, uh, I'm digressing a little bit, but, but Joseph had a boat in Newtown, uh, in, in, in the basement of his house, and my father would also, he and Joseph, sometimes I'd go with him and we would just push the boat out and go out of Newtown and fish. And he'd be talking to the fishermen, who they would come close to him, the, the boat and they would tell him where the banks were and all that. So he, That's he, amazing. He, he, so and at that time, he's chief minister. Yeah, yeah, he was chief minister. Yes. I, I know there's a story behind that because your father actually won the election in Newtown against Frank Barron. Mm -hmm. My father tells me the story six, about 14 days after I was born. I was born on the 1st of January, 61. Your father gave him a ride in his vehicle. And my father knew Frank Bryan very well. He'd known your father in Portsmouth because my father was in Portsmouth during the war when your father, I guess, was in agriculture. Mm -hmm. And he said, Mr. Libla, I don't think you can win against Bryan. You know, Bryan has been in town for a very long time. Mm 
Yeah. And he said, the only thing your father said to him is, Christian, you will see. Oh. <laughs> you will see. And of course, he won. He won that election and Barron never went back into politics. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so I guess, but, you know, he, he had a very good relationship with the ordinary man. Is that what you're saying? Yes, yes. And, and, you know, and he had a, a remarkable uh, uh, thing for names. He, when he, um, he would meet people he, from, because he was at a, a center at Laplane at one time. Then in um, uh, Collihu, that was before I was born. Uh, Laplane after that, because that's where my sister was born, Erin. And then that's also after Portsmouth, uh, one mile. And then he went to the agricultural station, Vegas. But he would meet people in the street and call them by their first names, ask about, I mean, the whole lineage, the family. He had a remarkable memory for names and things. I see. So, um, you know, I, I, I was really, I, I couldn't remember names. Either. Would you say he was a friendly person or an aloof person? No, he was extremely friendly. I mean, uh, if we go back, yeah, he was extremely friendly with most people. And, and his favorite poem was, he had plastered to the wall, was If by Rudyard Kipling. If, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing days and blaming it on you, if all your men, if all men can trust you, but make allowance for the doubting too. And he talked in, in the, the poem, I can't remember it exactly, but he talked about if you can walk with kings, kings and keep your virtue, walk with fools, not lose the common touch. Uh, if neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you, but none too much. If you can live the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it, and which is more, you'll be a man, my son. Amazing. He had it plastered in, 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 in his office, his office, and he had us uh, learn it by heart. Amazing. As well, well as things like elegy written at ch ch country churchyard. So going back to your, your original question, though, he was a disciplinarian. Um, he would come home even if he had a few cocktails uh, with friends. and whatever. He'd come and he would ask about school. He would sometimes he would hang out with some of our principals, and then knowing what he, he was kind of he, he would he would set us up. He'd come and ask questions, and obviously if we were not uh, innocent about it, we would uh, get you know a whipping. Yes. Uh, when we were very young, and maybe some admonishment when we got a bit older. Um, I remember once uh, I was walking and tit. He had a big black guy, I can't remember his first name, and just by Newtown. And right next to the um, racquetball court, not racquetball, I'm sorry, tennis ball, tennis court. Uh, it was the tennis club. The Dominica club. Dominica club. And it is a narrow, there's a gutter and there's a little shoulder road, so the car was coming. And I stepped on the side, but when Tit passed with his car, kind of, I, I was imbalanced, and I jumped in the road. And the car had to swerve around me. And Tit told my father that I was kind of fooling around in the street and he almost killed me. And I got, it was the only whipping I got that I never, I thought I didn't deserve. <laughs> and I was going to grammar school at the time. So uh, at home he was a discipline and he always, uh, poetry was a big thing. We, he, so he was a poet scholar. He was a poet scholar. He was also good at math because when he did in London matric, he, I think he passed geography, economics, English, French, math. You know, he, but he but so he was, and he was very good at uh, geometry. You know, if he actually built the the last house we was in, the guy didn't finish the house, so he he finished most of it, and he we always used to tease him about the steps he built a little steep. You know, so. Okay. But, but, but yeah, he was a disciplinarian, definitely. So let me ask you this. So you come to the grammar school in what year? 1962. And uh, what were your favorite subjects? Uh, my favorite subjects were, at that time, you know, I, I don't recall having any favorite. I, I, I was kind of oriented a little bit to science. I was very good at math. Yes. And throughout, all, all the way through uh, fifth form, sixth form, I have uh, A-levels in math. Yes. But uh, I was always, uh, I, I remember it. Was and that's the A-levels at Cambridge University? Cambridge University, yes. So my, uh, I did all levels uh, at Cambridge. 
What did you do at uh, A-levels? What subjects? Math and physics. Yes, yes. And, uh, and we're going to talk about the physics in a little bit, but yeah, yeah. while you were at grammar school, who was the principal when you got in? Well, when I got in, it was... Um, I can't remember who... It was Gordon Medford, I remember, was the... I, th I think it was Aaron Clark. It was prior to Aaron Clark. Yeah, it was Aaron Clark. Gordon Medford was the assistant headmaster. Where's Deputy Gordon Medford headmaster. from? Barbados. And Clark. And, and Clark was Guyana. Yes. And Clayana had been an M.A. Cantab, um, very short guy. There was a story about Clark, we used to call him Pepe. Was the M.A. mean Master of Arts? Arts, yeah, yeah. Canterbury? Canterbury, yeah. And when we, uh, when I was, so that was at the old, where the old Rosa Boy School was, mm -hmm. there was a big tamarind tree. Yes. And the new grammar school wasn't built yet? No, it wasn't. So I, I spent, a, I can't remember, a couple of years, I think, and before, it was being built, and then we moved over. So I transitioned. So you're one of the, the new, new you're one of the first students at the at the new at grammar the school. new grammar school, yes. And um, I remember um, I was being bullied by one particular guy. I mean, you 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 know his famous Reed. He was with the defense force. Malcolm Reed. Malcolm. Reed. I have a story of Malcolm Reed as and a cadet. Uh, we he, was, he was under, very indisciplined, actually. Yeah, we were under the tamarind tree in the um, in the old grammar school. And let let the record reflect that Malcolm Reed was actually one of the prime conspirators in the Operation Red Dog to invade Dominica right, right. with the with the um, Ku Klux Klan. I actually, I have I have all the I have all the uh, notes on it, and I'm actually yeah. the last person alive on this earth with the knowledge of the plot, and we disclose it to the government, of course. Right. So he was arrested, but that's interesting. So he was a bully. Yeah, he was a bully, and uh, he was after me for a couple months, and I got tired of it, and we were in assembly line. And I threw a punch at him that felt good. But it was just, I just couldn't take it anymore. And I, I got, we both got punished, uh, you know. In those days, how were you punished? Days. Well, you get a caning. <laughs> uh, <laughs> later on, you know, we had the black books and caning, and sometimes you might get away from any tensions, obviously. But another interesting thing that happened at school, uh, uh, there was a guy by the name of Bunting, George Bunting, I think was his name. Yes. His father was, I think, working at the, at the gardens area. He, he lived behind the gardens. And he, 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 he was teaching me how to do, uh, you know, we had, we had these cap guns. Yes. And instead of the caps, he would take a, a wire, almost uh, the, with the size of a wire hung, and he would wrap it around it, turn it in, and then you would take the thing and throw it against a wall. And mm -hmm. the spring me mechanism would just hit the... Um, whatever the material was in there, ignited. Yes. And he's teaching me to do this thing in class, yes. you know, under the desk. Yes, yes. And when he was halfway done, I kind of pushed his hand and yes. there was an explosion in the class. <laughs> and I think it was, it, I don't know if it was S.P. Richards or Jeff Charles, I can't remember, but, but did, and I, I kind of played, played innocent because after all it was hit. So anyway, that was just a side. Yes. I, this was one of my memories from yes. the school. He may have been related to Alan Bondin, who used to work at Smith and Lord. Alan Bondin went to Vietnam and got wounded, actually. All right, okay. They were, they were, they were white, if it's the same Bondin, yes. they were yes. white yeah, Dominicans. Yeah, Dominicans, yes. The roots were in Texas, actually. Okay, good. Yes. I don't know if it was George was his name. I can't remember. I know Bondin was his last name. Yes, yes. <laughs> so essentially what we have is you're at the grammar school now. You graduate in what year? Uh, I, I graduated in, I think it's 70, 71. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then what, what was the path for you? What, what path did you follow thereafter? Uh, well, I taught at grammar school for a year, and I taught uh, science and, well, I taught math, uh, yeah, mo yeah, predominantly math I, I taught at grammar school for a year in the third, second, third, fourth forms. And, uh, and then I went over to UWE. Uh, in Trinidad to pursue engineering. I did not complete uh, down there. I, I, you know, after a couple of years, I decided uh, I I didn't really like it at UWE because I found it was highly theoretical, and I wanted something that was more uh, applied. And and by the way, I mean it was really. Uh, uh, and when you say uh, UWE, you mean the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine. Yes. Yeah. The former site of ICTA, actually, where your father went to school. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. It's yes. the Imperial College of Tropical Agriculture right, was right. based there at St. Augustine. Right. I remember playing uh, soccer, you know, uh, you know, on campus, you know, between the halls. And then when I went back to Dominica, I uh, went to PSS. I taught 
PSS. That's the post, post secondary school. school the, for, the first years. secondary school outside Rosa. Outside Rosa, yes. I took to, together with people like uh, um, Judith Garraway, Arundel that, around that Thomas, and there was um, Anthony Lockhart, you know, uh, Gregory Abes, and, and others. Any notable students? Oh, yes. Uh, I'm not sure if it's the same Alec Lawrence because I left town again many years ago. But uh, there was an Alec Lawrence in the class, uh, Monty Douglas, who is a doc doctor now in Connecticut, good friend. There was brother, this, younger brother of Roosevelt younger Douglas. Younger brother of Roosevelt Douglas, yes. <clears throat> he actually did his residency in Rochester. And um, there was also, oh yeah, uh, a young lady from... Uh, as Demay, who is also a doctor, she's now in Barbados. Yes. And uh, two two young guys uh, who were brothers to their father was a pharmacist in Portsmouth. I see. And one of them actually went to Cuba to do his medical degree. So there were some very good students in that class. So then you left Portsmouth and you went to the United States. And then I yeah after two years I I always you know wanted to get back and track and finish my studies. So I came to the United States, I had the option of going to Howard University, um, or, or uh, actually, no, that's not, not I, actually, Rusey Douglas sent my paperwork to University of Saskatoon. Saskatchewan? Saskatchewan, right, because he, he knew uh, some people there. And uh, I applied to University of Toronto, Guelph, and a few others, McMaster, because my interest was going to a Canadian school. I thought they were much better than American schools. Went up to Toronto, stayed with a, a friend, and I was just getting things, you know, I was not getting anywhere. And I, I don't know if it was, I suspect it was because Rosie had been trying to help me. So I, I this is just, you know, uh, my I guess. But I, anyway, I left, and I... Uh, was on my way back to my teaching job because I had not resigned yet. And when I was in New York, in New York with family, they said, well, geez, why don't you go ahead? I went to Iona. The school had started. I got registered in the physics department. I got about a year of uh, credits transferred from Trinidad. So I did the degree in three years, and I joined the physics department. And then that was Iona. I met quite a few Dominicans who... The name some names? Uh, there was, um, well, Patrick Henderson was one. Um, there was uh, Howard Shillingford. And um, there was another Shillingford, young Shillingford. Dr. Dorian Shillingford's son was there at the time also. He was a junior to me. But there were, you know, there were some others and some of, you know, in the New Rochelle area. Yeah, uh, like Roy Mitchell. Yeah, right. Well, Leroy Mitchell was a professor there in, in the. I, I accounting is in accounting. In accounting, yes. I, I, I used to talk to him periodically. Yeah. Roy Mitchell is a PhD in accounting from Portsmouth. Yeah, Leroy. Leroy, Leroy. Yeah, yeah. So you did the first degree, that's BS in physics. Mm -hmm. And then what, what after? What, did, what is the Well, problem? then then I, uh, once I, I was, uh, I became inducted into the um, Society of Physics Students. Um, as a, It's an honorary thing, you know, if your grades are good. So... I, 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 my grades were pretty good there. And then I got a scholarship. Uh, uh, initially, I was accepted at Stony Brook to do a master's degree. But I get a, got a better scholarship at Stevens Institute of Technology in Hoboken. Mm -hmm. And uh, they also had me teaching a, a class in, uh, for minorities in the New York, New Jersey area mm -hmm. on, on the weekends for high, high potential students. Outstanding. Yeah, outstanding. So the master's then, degree at, at uh, was it Stony Brook or uh, Stevens? No, Stevens Degree. It was in material science and metallurgy. And I did that for two years. And I was also a teaching assistant, so I taught an undergraduate class, you know. So you've got a master's of science in metallurgy? In, yes, in, in, in material science, material science and metal, including metallurgy. Yes. Yeah. Did, you, did you pursue any studies beyond that? Yes, after, well, when I was there, I got, a, I got, an, I, I got an offer from IBM in Fishkill, uh, which I turned down in favor of an offer from Xerox in Rochester, because my former boss had been in the same department, so he called the school asking for potentially 
you know, good candidate. So my professor came to me. Actually, I was teaching in one of the undergraduate classes, and he knocked on the door and he said, "Do you want a job in Russia?" And I said, "Where's Russia?" You know, upstate. You know, so there's this thing about upstate and downstate. Yeah. So anyway, I they flew me in. I got in there, and it was in the summertime. I didn't know that it was so cold. Mm -hmm. You know, until the winter came. But anyway, uh, I met some one guy who had the same advisor as I did, who was probably the world's expert in electro deposition of, of, of certain aspects of electro deposition. So uh, I was hired on the spot and I said, well, uh, okay. Well, I called my wife and I said, uh, I just got married uh, two years before. So I said. And, and you know your wife's name? Uh, Rosalind. Uh, and, and where's Rosalind from? From, from Barbados. What's the maiden name? Stout. S T O U T E. Yes. And then your children? Uh, well, yeah, in you know, Rochester we had children uh, Erica, Gina, and Brent. Erica is, a, I think, is she a journalist or? Well, no, she's uh, marketing and uh, in marketing marketing training. And yeah. she worked with Thompson Reuters for a while. And, and the other daughter? Uh, Gina is an uh, attorney. She works with a law firm in Washington, D.C. And your son? And my son, Brandt, he works for a hotel chain. Yes, indeed. Yeah, my. And, and, and when you went to Rochester, um, what, that firm, Xerox, a major U.S. copying company, make, make of copy machines, right? Yes. yes. Were you in an administrative position or were you in a research and development or well, manufacturing? Well, when I first went in there, I, I was in, in a sort of manufacturing research where we, we did um, making very advanced products with materials because of material science background. Mm -hmm. So I worked very closely with companies like Horning to develop things like charge electrodes for inkjet printers. Mm -hmm. And we were cutting edge in those days because we were dealing with materials that were just being developed, you know, uh, alloys and glasses and ceramics. So I, I did that for a while and then I got into um, a rotational program which was they took uh, about a dozen premier engineers, young engineers, to give them a cross-rotational uh, experience through the company. So I spent one year in design and uh, a year, half a year in manufacturing and a half a year in uh, service. And I was so pleased, uh, a couple of weeks ago we were speaking, you told me you have a couple of patents uh, on, on, uh, in, 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 uh, in uh, copying technology. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, well, I, I moved to a company because one of the things, once you've been through a rotational program, that's a good segue, you, you are positioned in different, uh, high potential, you're posi positioned in different functions within the company. So you get across organizational experiences. And uh, so what I did was, um, along the way, I was in different manufacturing, design, or engineering functions. And there were a lot of opportunities for, you know, in innovation and inventions. And some of my inventions uh, I did when I worked in the scanner business. So it's a, a microelectronic device used essentially as, as a, similar to an eye where you just pick the image off a page and you transform it into digital bits and bytes. Amazing. And then it's processed, you know, for printing. Yes. So, uh, working on a scanner, we actually had silicon wafers and we would have dice them and, and all that. And we would actually, we, we were trying to make a linear sensor because prior to that, all the um, imaging was done with reduction optics, which uses a lens, but that required a lot of space in the machine. So, we figured that if we, with the advent of uh, a lot of semiconductor technologies, if we could have uh, uh, chips and put them in a linear array, with something called a self walk lens, you could minimize the amount of space in the machine. So, you know, the footprint and size of the product was very important to us. The machine would be more compact. It, more compact, essentially. But also, we could use the, the digital power of the device to do post-processing and do a lot of with the images. I see. So, so I was uh, working with a team where we actually de designed the wafers by a third party, had them diced within, and uh, well, very, very small chips. And we would put it in an array using machines that uh, I helped develop. So we worked with, with a company in Canada, the same company actually that built 
the uh, shut the, the the robotic arm for the shuttle. Mm -hmm. So, and I was by the way I, by that then I was a sort of a, a engineering manager of the, of the team, and we worked with this team to custom make this equipment for us to put these devices together, within about two microns positional accuracy. Now think about it, the hair on your head is about 100 microns. Amazing. So to be able to have a mechanical system to glue chips to two microns is really wasn't an easy chip. So we had to use microscopes, we had to use vibra vibration isolation uh, for the equipment. And it cost us a million dollars a pop. So we had two of these machines built for us in Canada. Amazing. And then, so I, and it was a clean room, so you, you know, you had to, to get in there, you had to you suit, had to up, and suit so up and yeah, and all that. Yeah. But Ewan, I, I just want to compliment you on, on, on that sort of accomplishment in science. And, and uh, so, how many patents in all do you hold now? Well, I, I have four patents, but I had uh, many more in, inventions, and some of the others were um, the, the company decided to keep them trade secret. Yes. Because some patents, if you publish them, they become a recipe for others. for others to get an inkling of what you're doing. Yes. So to, to maintain the intellectual property and propriety of the technology, they decided. So I have several, I don't know how others many, that have not, that, been, that, that, that have not they've, been patented. They've not seen the light of day in the public yeah. domain. But the patents that I had was, was actually four. Yes. Yeah. Outstanding. I, I know that today has been a long day, but I just thought it important to record not only the accomplishments of your father, but also to find out a little more about what made him the person he was and a little bit about your family life. Tell us a little bit about your siblings and what they did. Yeah, uh, well, I, you know, Einst, uh, uh, oh, I, before I, I, I should have mentioned, while I was at Xerox, I did another master's in engineering and manufacturing management. I see. At Cla it was an executive program at Claxton, Claxton University in upstate New York, too, but it was also... Um, um, in lieu of an MBA, so you know, I, I, I had the opportunity to do that. But anyway, going back to my siblings, um, my brother Einster, he um, he actually did his bachelor's in New York at uh, purchase, SUNY Purchase, did a master's at University of Rochester, his MBA, and uh, I believe he taught you. Taught me, taught me in fifth form. He was <laughs> yeah. my former master in, yeah. in, 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 in fifth form. And then he was the controller uh, for the, the Department of Psychology at the University of Rochester. Outstanding. And then he left uh, because while he was in... Co I, actually, I, I, he, I'm sorry, he did not get his degree in New York. He finished up in California. He had moved to California mm -hmm. uh, where my other brother stayed, Elizabeth. And he did his uh, degree there. Um, and I can't remember. But he actually got a scholarship, a Warren Moon scholarship. Warren mm. Moon was the quarterback for the Oilers, the yeah. football team, yes. the African-American guy. So he got a scholarship there, finished up in California, and, and then he he had been working with a small company that uh, remanufactured uh, gyroscopes and things like that. Amazing. So when he came to Rochester, he finished his, he got his MBA, he went back to work for the company and then he became president of the company and he was part, part owner. 